Hi friend, Niklas here from Your Audio Solutions. Hope you are doing well and welcome to today's show. On the show today, we have producer and engineer Mark Needham. And he has worked with artists such as Fleetwood Mac, Shakira, Elton John, and many others. But it doesn't stop there. Mark is also an expert in artist development and has developed artists such as The Killers and Imagine Dragons and many others. I'm sure you've heard about those two at least. So it was a pleasure talking to Mark and I think you are going to love this interview as well and be able to find some valuable stuff you can take away and apply to your own work or career. But before we get into the interview with Mark, I'd love for you to join the Audio Tribe. And being a member of the Audio Tribe gives you exclusive access to interviews before the public, live Q&As and live streams. It's absolutely free to join, of course. All you have to do is just enter your name and email address using the link in the description below, and you are in. I'd love to see you there. Also, feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel or Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you are consuming this podcast. But that's enough of me talking. Let's get into the interview with Mark Needham. So, Mark, thank you for coming on. It's a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I've been looking forward to doing this. Thanks for having me. Awesome, man. Um, I, I actually thought it would be fun to start out with something that's not music related, uh, but something fun I read about you on your website, uh, full disclaimer. Uh, but it said you're, you are um, able to marry people. Because uh, you're, Are you a captain or what was the deal? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a licensed boat ca- uh, captain to the Coast Guard. So. I guess if we're far enough offshore, if we're out in international waters outside of 12 miles, I guess they could, yes. Right. Oh, so you have to be... Plank and stuff, I don't know. Right. Oh, so you have to be actually 12 miles out? Is that the... Yeah, I have to be out in international waters. Ah, I didn't know that was the, the rule. <laughs> um, but how, how come you wanted to become a, a captain then? Uh, I've, I've been boating a long time and... You know, I would, I would get on the boat by myself, and maybe drive you know 100 miles offshore out to an island. And um, I, I really, I mean, the first thought is maybe I'd be a little safer. Just the more I know about seeing other lights on the horizon, what type of what type of boat it is, um, and just you know, more, more, a little deeper into navigation and stuff like that. Just. Yeah, just because I would, you know, I'd be by myself for two or three days out on the ocean, sometimes sometimes longer, and on long drives at night, you know, it's just it's, it's <laughs> difficult seeing these the little rows of light on the horizon trying to figure out what it is before it runs you down, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that makes sense. Um, but so, uh, do you go out in the ocean? Because you live in LA, right? So it must be the Pacific Ocean. That's your ocean. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, we have a commercial boat that runs, that, uh, and I go out as a captain sometimes on the boat. But I just, I just love being out in the ocean. It's a, it's something I can do every now and then just to kind of clear my head from music, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because no one can really call you out there, I guess. Yeah, it's you know, it's just nice being you know. There's, there's no noise. There's no lights. You know, you're just. You're out on the ocean, maybe under, you know, sixty miles or hundred miles offshore, and it's, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a departure from the studio for me. So yeah, 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 that's, that's, yeah, exactly, man. Um, but Mark, let, let's still into. Uh, I mean, you have many, many talents. Obviously, you've done awesome work, awesome music, developed awesome artists. Um, but I should like to delve deeper into the the artist part. Uh, and something I want to ask is like with all the artists you, you have developed that have become a success, um, has there become or has there been like a common um, trait or skill that they all have shared? Or, or is there like one thing that you can see they all have done that actually helped them become what they became? Well, except, except you know, you. <laughs> if I, you know, if, if making the choices to get involved or not, it's the, 
it was really the first thing. And I, I base that on, you know, just uh, number one, having to, to be a, or the or just the artist have that star quality. You know, you hear them sing a song, and it and the believability factor is is one hundred percent. You know, in the delivery, um, are the lyrics. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't think some people put enough focus on the lyrics, and I think for 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 a band or an artist to really be a career a, a career artist, so they're still playing in thirty or forty years, I think really putting a lot of focus on the lyrics is as much as the melodies is just as important. Um, so you know, it's just really trying to find that the artist that is also just so driven that that this is all they're going to do for the rest of their lives, you know, and they're going to work incredibly hard at it. It's, it's a very, it's a very difficult job and, and, you know, eats up a lot of your time and relationships and your health sometimes. So, you know, it's just finding somebody who's really that driven that they, that they really want to succeed. Makes sense. But you, you mentioned uh, believability. What is it? Uh, in a in a vocalist, for example, that makes them, according to you, believable. You know, it's just honesty in the delivery. Mm. Whether they wrote the lyrics or not, I mean, it could have been done with someone could have been done with co-writers. But to me, a great vocalist makes you just believe that story and make it your own story. Mm. Uh, so you know, they, they they find a way in the lyrics to. To really feel that this is personal to them, but also can be personal to to whoever that listener is. The the lyrics are broad enough that people can own the story themselves. Right, right, right. Um, and obviously that goes with the delivery as well. But does it have to be perfect to be believable, or what's your take on that? Oh, oh absolutely not. I mean, you know, I mean it's. You know, every song is different, so I can't say yes. Sure. That's universally except great across all songs. But you know, I just you know, I, I, I just making me believe that they they believe this story that they're telling me. What you know? Right, right. You know, See, sort of. Do, a... do you love him? Is it about you know? Is it about life? It, whatever. But I feel that I take a message away from it. Right. And. And it's you know, and, and be able to create that emotion in the listener that thirty years later they hear that song and they snap right back to that that time in their lives. Yeah, yeah, that's that. that I mean, yeah, every, everyone has those songs. I think where they do have yeah. that. You know, you have those songs growing up, right? Mm -hmm. And twenty five years from now, you'll hear those songs, and it's like. Oh my God! I'm right back in that place, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. like the sense of smell or something. But exactly. Um, so if I can, you know, if I can find those kind of songs and those kind of artists, and and hopefully partner up with them, you know, that's that's usually how I succeed. So. Right. Uh, but, but what's your song that takes you back to childhood? Uh, do you have uh, any of those songs or moments? Oh gosh, I have. I mean, I have so many of them that you know all the songs I've worked on. I hear them, and that brings back right, right. that back to moments. And you know, growing up from God, the, the early them stuff, like Van Morrison when he was in them with Glory, right. that was one of the first songs I I learned how to play on guitar with our little band and um, The Who. You know, when they came out with some of their early records, uh, you know, I've got, there's just so many, you know, there's so many songs that bring back all these different points of my life now, because, mm. again, this is all I've ever done, I've never really had a job besides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I didn't want to go right here exactly now, but let's go there anyway, um, which is, when you did start out in the industry, which was, was that in the 70s, or when was it? Probably 1970, 71. Right. Um, what was your experience actually getting into the industry? Did you have any early struggles or was there was it hard for you to yeah, to get your foot in the door? 
Well, I, you know, I, I was led, I lived in a little town of about 75 people up in Northern California. And my, my guitar teacher wanted to go to San Francisco and start a, a rock music school. So mm. I graduated high school early and, and went down with him to San Francisco and helped start this music school. Um, and, you know, I was kind of, I was a guitar player, somewhat drummer, but also I always, you know, I was a guy who always tore his amplifiers apart or rewired his guitars or, you know, with <laughs> different ways to, to plug my tape recorder into this and that and come up with, you know, so I was, yeah, yeah. Uh, the technical part was always really part of my life growing up and I started a, a small studio in a like basically just a closet in the music school. I had a, um, a four input two mixer and a two track tape recorder and uh, one microphone and I started to record, I, you know, I actually started recording a bunch of stuff for a small label called Kicking Mule Records. They did, they did right time guitar, that was their, that was their thing. And, Got to work with some really fabulous guitar players, and you know the studio kept growing. And you know, probably in within three years, I split off from the school and started my own studio. Right. Um, probably nineteen by nineteen seventy six, I think I got my first big major label album. I never really, I never worked as an assistant in the studio. I okay. I, I, I read a lot of books and learned on the job just convincing people that I knew what I was doing even though I really didn't I saw in 1976 <laughs> I got my first major label album on Warner Brothers with a artist named Taj Mahal yeah yeah listen to that record it's really cool yeah we ended up doing two or three records together and yeah, yeah. Uh, that was you know at that point we had a, a 24 track studio and an 8 track studio we had a couple rooms we we built our own 24 track and built our own console because we wow. couldn't afford we couldn't afford to buy one. So we kind of we built our own. And I, I had a partner who was a re really good technically. He was a guitar player, but also uh, you know just great at electronics and machining and stuff like that. So we bought a a used two inch videotape recorder and and he converted helped convert it into a 24 track audio recorder. We bought it for five hundred dollars at a place awesome. up by the airport, and you know. Mm. But uh, how, how did you? I mean, being self-taught and you build your own studio, how did you uh, manage to get? Well, yeah, Warner Brothers to want to hire you for this project. I mean, Taj came by and he was in San Francisco. You know, he he lived in the Bay Area at that time, on and off, and he came by the studio and and met with us and you know i think you know i think he he made a, made a decision to you know to record with us I, you know i don't know if it was because we were offering a really good rate or if we believe in the, the passion that we had you know right. um <laughs> you know thank you Todd. it was a, you know it was a it was a it was great. It was a great first credit for me, and I yeah, always, yeah, of course, <laughs> I'd, been a, I'd been a big fan of his for years as well. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was super exciting. The band was so, was Taj was so great to work with, and the band was fantastic. And you know, it ended up being um, you know we did that album. We worked on that for God, four or five months, and we ended up doing maybe one or two more albums. I can't remember right now. Right. Right. Um, but what has been your, uh, uh, maybe not strategy is the wrong, is the wrong word, I think, but building relationship, cause that's the name of the game, I guess. And that's ultimately how you got where you are today. Uh, so what has been the best way for you to build relationships within the industry? So you actually, you know, which allowed you to build the career you've had. I, I just, uh, I worked really hard, at, you know. I, I, I worked really hard trying to be good at what I do, and mm -hmm. I'm very. Uh, I've always been very invested in this. I, I sometimes I care too much, you know. I mean, 
it breaks my heart if I hear something that I don't like. Mm. I mean, you know, I, I mean, it'll literally crush me if I did something that I don't think was as good as it should have been. And so maybe it's that passion that helped me to develop that. I, you know, I dealing with you know later in my life dealing with with bigger with bigger stars. I never I never treat anybody like. With kid gloves, I'm never really honest about what I think about. You know, if this part is working, so if a part is working or a mix is working. Um, um, so I've, I've never, I've never been afraid to make, to live out on the edge and make, you know, make bold statements or choices. I don't know about bold, but crazy choices. You know, or or statements and. Um, so I've always been a risk taker. I'm not afraid to, to take risks and put and put my career on the line for just for saying something. I disagree with this, or I, you know, or let's try this arrangement, or um, and that's worked out for me. You know, the majority of the time that's worked out for me over the years. Not always. Um, so you know, some people take offense to that, uh, but you know, I, I am who I am, and. Mm. But um, I was talking to some other, some other people um, and the importance of saying uh, yes, even though you don't know, maybe you don't know how, how to do something, but you get, you, someone asks you, oh, do you want to do this job? And you say, yes, uh, yes, without even actually knowing. Is that something, it sounds like that's something you would do as well, right? To take that risk. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I again, I, I never really had a job. I just, you know, I... Right started doing music and and trying to make a and trying to figure out how to make a living at it and get good enough that I could actually start doing important records uh, um, I, you know I, I I would say yes to anything and but uh, even if I knew how to do it or not I would if I didn't know how to do it I would figure it out yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was I was never afraid to jump into anything no there was way over my head, you know, I'd jump in the deep end of the pool anytime. Yeah. With, with a bunch of bricks in my arms, I don't care, you know? Right, right. Yeah, I think that's a really important um, skill, you know, for, especially in the music industry, I, I guess, you know, where you might get a call and it's like, shit, can I do it? But yeah, you should just jump like you have done, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know that it's the best trait for a lot of people in, in their life, you know, being so, I know, I'm the opposite of risk averse, mm. um, but I'm still here, you know, and that's the other reason I really like developing artists, it, al it allows me to help steer my career rather than let right. the last hit record you have define you for 10 years. I mean, mm. It's great that, it, that you know, you'll, uh, when I did Wicked Game with Chris Isaac, or, mm -hmm. um, you know, but, you know, for five years, I'm getting a lot of work on that. But then you start to realize, like, everybody's just coming to you for that sound. It's like, I did that already. Right, <laughs> you know, right, right. I, really, I don't really need to repeat that. I mean, I, you know, I helped, I helped figure out this thing with Chris, and we came up with a cool sound, but I don't want to repeat it over and over. And I think that's another mistake people make in their careers is, just getting locked in as that guy who does mm. one style of music. I, I, you know, I produced and mixed a lot of a lot of jazz records. I worked in. Uh, I had a company in the Bay Area that would fly me out to New York to to do jazz records when I was probably in early twenties. Mm. I did all the ragtime stuff. I, you know, I tried to really do a lot of different styles of music. Um, a lot of Latin stuff, but, you know. But really, you know, I think that served me. That served me well, especially in the past fifteen or twenty years, because because of the internet and people combining so many styles together. Now, um, I think that I, you know, I was doing a lot of that stuff early in my career. That that served me well, you know, in the past fifteen or twenty years as well. Right, makes sense. Um, 
But so when, when, when it comes to developing artists and stuff, you, you spoke about obviously believability that you have to believe in the artist. Um, but are there any other like questions or doubts that you need to get resolved before you take the, the artist to the next level, so to speak? I mean, we have a, a band that we're working with now out of Minneapolis and, you know, it's just seeing what they've done on their own, you know, how they've, you know, they've started to build a following in a small, in a, you know, in, in, a, in a local, localized community. Mm -hmm. um, are they able, <clears throat> are they, you know, right now, do they have, a, what are their socials not look like? And, um, in talking with the band, if you're pointing out what's wrong in their socials or with the artist, are they, are they able to really listen and grow? And, um, songwriting, uh, you know, it's being able to communicate with somebody and not just say, yeah, this song is great. You know, it's like, well, it's good, but, you know, if, well, let's, are you open to trying this, this, and this? And, you know, some of those choices might be good. Some of them might not be. I mean, I will, you know, I'll throw out a bunch of things that I think might help help develop this. And but you know, the only way to really tell is give it a try and, and see if it works better. And, you know, it's, I, I think the artist needs to be open to that as well. Do they, do they have the work ethic, you know? Knowing what this is going to take, most bands don't realize, you know, what going from from zero to 150 miles an hour in your career is, is how that's going to affect them and the amount of work that it takes to go from playing, you know, you're playing clubs for 80 or 100 people, and six months later you're on, you know, you're on tour playing in front of 20,000 seats and there's all these interviews and you've got to be writing the next album and you're on the bus and you're, you know, and you're doing that for two years and coming back and, and the, uh, the label's expecting you to have a new album ready to go. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, just seeing if he, you know, just seeing if I, if I think they'll be able to handle right, right, that right. level of workload, that, right. you know. Yeah, that's pretty fascinating. That's something I, I never thought about would be a factor, but it definitely makes sense. Um, but yeah, I've seen so many artists burn out, you know, mm, that mm. they come back from the first three-year run and they're just, right. I mean, they're, they're destroyed, you know. I, I can imagine. I mean, I can imagine it, be, it, is, it must be tough being on the road. I've never been on the road myself really like that, but I can imagine it is, it is hard, you know. Uh, but it's, I guess it's also hard for anyone starting out anyway. doesn't matter which area of the music industry you are in, I guess. It, it's, yeah, it's, not, it's certainly not an easy career choice. No. <laughs> um, but you mentioned like uh, how you look at bands or if it's a local band or you're looking at their social media, it, for example. What is, a, is there some sort of a metric that you go by or is it, could it be anything? On the, let's say social media, does it have to be ten thousand fans, or is there such a number, or that's not relevant? No, for for me, you know, I'm different than a major label where I don't really have to look at. I can weigh. I can weigh more on whether I love. I love this song. I believe in this. Song. Whether or not they have, they have, they only have two hundred fifty followers, and they can draw eighty people to a club. You know, I have the freedom to just, you know, I love this and I see something with this. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I, at, at a major level, obviously, there's a lot more, you know, but people are, are, are really putting, a, 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 the, the numbers, the actual social media numbers really play a lot bigger role, you know, 80% of the decision on whether to sign something, just because they really want to see that it's, that it's developed to a point or you can say you can say if we just throw gasoline on this, right, right, this right. is going to explode. Um, I can help get it to that point right. where labels are excited about it. We have a band we signed almost Monday from San Diego. Um, that I mean, I have five times as many social media followers as they did. Um, but I heard the band, and and when I first when I first met these guys, I just I. I love their attitude. I love their work ethic. Um, I love the lead singer Dawson. His voice just, you know, 
just really made me feel something. So, mm. you know, again, it, it's it's my time. You know, if, if I believe in it, I can invest in it. It's not not a record, a major label that has to weigh the, you know, that that has to weigh putting five million dollars into this band. Mm. You know, right. am I going to lose my job over over? You know, pushing to invest in this band that failed miserably. You know, I can, you know, I I have the option to, to really just take things that I believe in and try to get them to the point where we can partner with a major. Right, but what are your thoughts on the major labels these days? Is it, um, do you need them, or what was the benefit of having a major label I mean, deal? I mean, there's, you know, there are certainly a lot of people who've had. Tremendous success on their own, and I've worked. I, you know, I still work with a bunch of those artists who were totally independent, and they, you know, they've done. You know, we've they have a. Uh, they think a song that's in top ten at all radio this week. That's right. a total independent band, but for for blowing a band up to a worldwide phenomena, getting those those big worldwide tours and. You know, that's sometimes the help of having a major label, right. a big manager, a big booking agency, just be able to, you know, to pull all those things together in a short period of time. Right. Um, I mean, Imagine Dragons went from, you know, playing for 100 people at the Viper Room, mm -hmm. and God, 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 I forget how many months it was later, but it was less than a year, I think, to wow. play the the show at in Las Vegas for 20,000 people. Right, right. You know, and that's possible with a major label, so to speak. They have the resources. Right, it, right. I mean, they have those resources and the connections to, and plus with a great, with a great booking agency, um, great management, you know, it's, it's, uh, hmm. it's, you know, it's a big team that you really have to manage all the parts. Um, and, and then the stars just have to be aligned as well, or whatever, you know. I mean, you could have all those things and still fail miserably. But mm. uh, you know, if all those things can come together, and you know, the magic, the you know, the magic is ha happens to be there, things can blow up really quickly with the with those with those additional resources. Right, that makes sense. But you know, like label deals, are they? It's always been my understanding. Maybe maybe I'm wrong, uh, but it's always been my understanding that they're a really bad bank loan. <laughs> but may, maybe I'm wrong. Or what's your view on that? Except if you know, if you default on your mortgage, you don't have to pay it back. Right. You know. Right. You know, if the, if you think if the deal goes sideways, right, it's not like you still owe the label. Ah, okay. You know, so the label's taking a big risk, which is why they, you know. You know, if you went to a bank and had a loan, and if five years if the house wasn't working out, mm. you could just walk away and not owe them any money. Right. You would expect to pay a higher interest rate. Um, so, but there, you know, there are just resources. It's harder to get a really big booking agency involved without without label support. Right. You know, but, I mean. Some agencies will take on independent big will take on independent artists hmm. after they've you know you've really put the time in you put four or five or six years in building building a fan base across the U.S. and touring on your own and and really built that up to a, oh this is you know I've you know as a big booking agency yeah we want to be involved in this because these guys are are killing it you know hmm. um, it's harder to get or almost impossible to get. A big booking agency like that involved if you're just playing clubs in a local area. Right, right. I mean that's not going to happen. I mean, whether they're not, they're not going to risk the time. But if you've already, you know, if you've worked as an independent band and really worked on setting up your own touring across, uh, you know, if not the whole U.S. but at least major inroads into, you know, certain core areas, and you have a big fan base. But you know, it's. I mean, it's a decision each band really has to make hmm. on their own, which direction they want to go. Um, and certain styles styles of music, I think, are more conducive 
to just being able to record a song, and put it online, certainly in the EDM world. Right. Uh, so, you know, I mean, it's, 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 you know, if you want to be a major pop star and have a top, a number one radio hit, you're, it, it's really hard to get those top 10 slots without label support. Right. Makes sense. Uh, it can be done, you know? I mean, it can be done, but it's not easy. Right. Yeah, and I didn't know that about if you actually, that if if your music doesn't make it, that you don't owe the money still. I thought I was actually, they still owe them, but I guess not then, <laughs> which is good. No, they, they, I mean, they, they all own those masters, the label on the right, masters, right, right. particular songs. Um, I know a lot of bands that have been dropped that cut deals to get their masters back, right. you know. Um, so... You know, I mean, but but that that's the risk for the label, which is why you know why they don't just sign everybody. Sure. You know, they're they're investing a lot of money that they might they might not get a return on. Right. Make, makes sense actually. Um, but how do you when you have developed an artist or you about to or you're in the middle of it? Uh, what's your process of uh, pitching it to to labels? I mean, I guess now you have the relationships and the team behind you, but. How do you do it maybe before uh, today, so to speak? I mean, you know, early on we would just try to try to get three or four great songs recorded. Sometimes it was actually recording a whole album with hmm. with Hot Fuss, with The Killers. That record we had actually we had basically the whole album recorded. But um, you know, we. We had some relationships at that point. Obviously, I, I have more now, but that was in 2002 or 2003. And, um, I was with a, I'd signed with a, I had had a couple management companies, but I just signed with the guy that I'm with now. Right. Uh, so, you know, we partnered our relationships and, you know, I, I met with, you know, I would go out and meet with a lot of just cold meetings with a lot of label guys. Um, or, you know, I'm trying to play hot, so play this music to them, and they're all looking at their clocks and their phone, you know. Uh, like, when is this going to be over? i got to get this guy out of the room. i got something else important to do, you know. Right. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we've, as, you know, we've had, the more success we have, the, the easier it is, obviously, to get those meetings. And, yeah. Um, and, you know, what we've, you know, we have good relationships with everybody at all the labels, so it makes it easier. They know they're working with us on a project. That, you know, there, there's going to be six months of contract negotiations. And, you know, I, I mean, we talk to the band, we, to the label. We all know where this is going to kind of work out. And right. so we're, we're able to, to use those relationships to hopefully make things go smoother for the band. And, mm -hmm. and and you know, tell them about what all, all the pitfalls are that can go wrong with, you know, they can go wrong on a major label deal. Um, so, I mean, that that's stuff that we bring to the table when we're when we're working with the band. Right. Um, but like, for example, with the Hot Fuzz record, because yeah, like you said, it was hard to pitch it at first. So, how did you finally land it at a label? And who? How did you make them believe in what you had? You know that we we we've gone to every label in the in the U.S. and been turned down. So uh, my I had, I had two partners on. We had a production company. We signed three bands, and uh, it was a, my my ex lawyer and then partner in the production uh, Jeff Saltzman and uh, a guy named Braden Merrick. And you know I think. At, at, we, we tried everybody in the U.S. and Braden, you know, we had been turned, nobody wanted the record and Braden had started going to just the indies in the U.K. and I think probably one of the last, last indies available was Lizard King right. and they loved the record, you know, Martin, Martin loved the record and, and they ran with it and, you know, it was, they're already, we'd already kind of done a campaign with, with dance remixes of Mr. Brightside and all the all the all the, the nightclubs and um, you know it, it got to it got to Radio One and 
you know, blew up so mm. quick. It was, and that allowed, you know, but Blizzard King had that territory, but, but they didn't have the worldwide distribution on it. So, right. but that, once labels were able, you know, it was a really kind of different sounding record. Mm. Uh, but once, you know, the labels in the U.S. saw, oh, this is having, you know, this is having success, right. then they were able to come back and sign with Island. Right. Island could put a couple cans of gasoline on this thing. And, yeah. And, and, you know, within nine or ten months, they were, uh, you know, they went from playing for 250 people to 20,000 people mm. every night. I mean, when, when you're in that situation where you have pitched it to you, all the U.S. labels, it's not working. What was going through your head then? Like, did you ever doubt that it was not going to do well? Or, yeah, what was going on then? Probably. I mean, I don't think anybody really thought it would do, be as big, that record would be as big as it was. But, right. um, you know, we just, you just keep plugging away. Right. You, know, I, uh, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to call it quits on shopping because... Mm. The, I mean, it, you know, I mean, taste change and people get more up. So, I mean, some of these things have taken over two years, right, to, right, to get to get a deal and and for people to really get exposed to it. But I mean, you just have to kind of manage, you know, how much time you're going to put into. You know, you have to also have to know when to let go and go. Okay, you know. To move on, this isn't working. Um, and how do you uh, do that then? Like, what's the point when you say this is not working or whatever? You know, I guess it, it depends on where you know. I go back if I go back and listen to the songs, you know, it's been a year. I go back and listen every time I hear the songs in one of these meetings. That they're always very revealing when you're you're in the in A and R office and you're playing on. Just maybe the speakers are not really that good, and um, and even if the, you know, and you know, there's certainly just there's that tension in the air. Are they gonna love this? Are they just gonna get on the computer? And, yeah, that's great. You got another right. guy. Here. <laughs> I can listen to it in those in those meetings. Every time I listen to it, I go, "Damn, that this is good." You know, mm -hmm. it's like okay, we'll keep. We'll, we'll keep fighting for this, right. um, you know. And in the development process, you, you know, I went. I I certainly run into these where it's like, no, this is you know. I don't really see the artists getting to getting to a point where they've they've really discovered internally who they were, and they're just you know right. delivering this huge bullet, you know. Mm. Believable performances and the songs are getting better every time. Um, you know, if I see that happening, then sometimes it's better. Hey, you know, maybe I'm not the guy to be able. Maybe there's somebody else who's better for for getting that the artist to where they need to be. And you know, then we'll just part by you know part ways. Right. Try, to, try to keep it friendly. I have, I'm I'm friends with a lot of artists that I work with that mm. we ended up calling things quits, but. Um, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily blame the artist or myself. It's, you know, this, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, these two puzzle pieces just weren't fitting together. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you, do you have to talk to, to the bands and artists about managing expectations and stuff before you go into these meetings and trying to do the whole pitching thing? Yeah, I mean, we use, I usually don't have the artist in those initial right, meetings. Right, right. Anyhow, it's just... You know, I, I, my, I, my, my expectations are already pretty well under control on right. what kind of action you get. Even if somebody absolutely loves it, they're usually not going to fall all over you saying how wonderful this is. Mm. Um, I mean, that usually takes them living with something for a while and right. coming back to it. And, you know, um, I mean, every now and then we get, I've had those ones where we just played in... When, yeah, let's do a deal. Like, oh my God, seriously? You know, but um, so you know, and if if you know if the if the label is really interested, then we'll start setting up meetings with the band and hmm. you know, try to try to coach them on how to do a showcase and you know 
the questions that the an A and R guy is going to ask them, and you know, just have them kind of prepared for the, mentally for for this process. And you know, it's, we usually start. I usually start a band out with smaller labels and people that I, if the band, if 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 people want to start doing meetings, I try to start with people that I know that are going to just be a, make it a little more comfortable for them. Right. You know, it's a learning process after you've done five of those or ten, ten of those meetings with mm. like different booking agencies or labels and stuff. It starts to, you know, you start to learn what the questions and the process is. Right. Um, so we try to, you know, just we try to manage that, you know, with, with people who I know are going to make the band comfortable. To, to, you know, in the first couple of meetings, it's little test meetings to get them warmed up. Right. Uh, makes sense, man. Um, but let's say a band you're working with and they're not maybe quite at the believable stage or stage, whatever you want to call it. Um, how are you able to maybe push them, you know, to that next step so they become that great band, so to speak? I, I, I usually don't go in and try to record an album or five songs. You know, I would rather come in and I would rather write and finish one song at a time. Right. And, and just at that point of, the, of someone's career and just, because every time you come in, you know, you, you write a song, you record the song, record and produce the song, mix the song and then listen back to it and, and hear what worked and what didn't. The next song you go in, I mean, you know, you, you, you staircase off every one of those experiences, mm -hmm. and you get better. So, I mean, it's usually a, it's part of that process and just having a talk with the artist about what, you know, what, you know, what the artist thinks is working and not working in that first song and what, what, what you know, what I, as a, you know, what my company, what me representing my company, what I think is working and, you know, we just try to get better every time. Right. And that's pretty, that's pretty awesome, actually. Uh, so basically you let the artist themselves uh, almost discover, you know, what they need to improve on rather than you always <coughs> telling them, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, I don't want to, again, I don't want to come in and do 10 songs and get a snapshot. Right. You know, you, you, you have that snapshot of where you were, and by the time you finish those 10 songs, hmm. you know, do you still have that snapshot? It might, might be six months or nine months down the road, and if you did those one at a time, each one would have, you know, the, the progression at the end of right, right, right. Uh, song ten would have been so much better than it than just going in and tracking ten right off the bat. So I just think doing the writing, especially in that early stage, is doing the writing and coming up with a finished song. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you write, maybe you go in and write ten songs and you pick three or you know three or four. Let's do these one at a time and see where this is going. Um, I mean that's usually our process, and just and and look, just learn from every, you know, learn from every session. Just you know, here's ways we could have done the song. Here's here's ways we could approach the songwriting better, or um, you know, maybe this is really this the, the artist's voice feels better with more of a pop instrumentation behind it than an all rock thing or you know you try to just find that line and also try to come up with you know i like i would rather come up with something that's that's a unique and identifiable sound to that artist and not be trying to trying to chase what's on the radio or what's popular on spotify i mean i would re certainly rather come out with something just sound wise that's that's totally unique to that artist and you know uh, the first eight bars that come on you know who this is or four bars you know you just know that um i remember when i first started with just thinking back with chris isaac many many years ago when we first heard them playing in this uh it was like a punk club and in, in san francisco on broadway in san francisco um the band hated reverb they didn't want any reverb on anything you know right. and then i came that, you know eventually that came to be like just the opposite became to be that, that sound that you know you know as he mm -hmm. comes up that guitar sound or his voice and you know so it was, 
you know, that we did. It was something that kind of grew through those first early songs that we were doing. Right. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, but how, how do you also, you know, keep uh, trying to create something new? I mean, is, is, maybe that's just my, my prejudice that is wrong, but it feels like maybe labels these days are comfortable with one thing, but it's, that's why it's so refreshing seeing you trying to do something new, you know? But that's always been the case. I mean, right, right, they, right. they want to do what they know has been working mm. as a general rule. I mean, that's not certainly not true with, with everybody in the business. I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of people who have, who have been so important to the music business who really went out and found that cool new thing, you know, but, um, it's, you know, as a general rule, it's easier to, I right, let's invest in something we know is working. Right. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're trying to create something new every time is, you know, risky, yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not easy. It's something we, you know, we try to, try to find something that's really unique to that band and, hmm. and create a sound that works, you know, to help reinforce what the lyrics are saying and the mood the band's trying to create and that, you know, sometimes, sometimes, it, you know, you can be really successful with that and come up with something that's new and cool and sometimes not. Right. Yeah, I, it, exactly. It can still be a great song even though we didn't, you know, you still might great, make some great stuff even though you haven't broken that new, that new ground, you know, and it's harder and harder to break that new ground because, like, what hasn't been done, let me think, <laughs> you know. Um, but, you know, I still kind of strive for that every time. Sure. I mean, I think that makes total sense. I mean, you're right I, with saying that so much has been done. So how do you try to innovate if, if you know, how do you try to break that new ground? Do you have any a process that you go through or? Not really. Right. I mean, I just, I, you know, I've been doing this a really long time, so I'm, I can usually, if I hear something in my head, I can usually, I know, I can figure out how to create that. Right. But, you know, if I'm just listening to something go out, God, if it was, what if the vocal was doing, if, you know, so we had this filtered reverse thing going in and the, the delays got, you know, the delays were slightly at a time and the delays actually got longer each time. I, you know, I was like, mm -hmm. I, I have done that. You know, I know how to do that. I've done it a hundred times, a thousand times. Right, right. You know? Um, and, you know, again, having done a lot of different styles of music, you know, I, it just gives me a, hopefully a broader palette that I can remember and go back and choose from. And But I can usually, if I hear something in my head, I can make it happen. Right. Um, and, you know, I kind of, I, I grew up, in, you know, I was born in the 50s, so I kind of grew up, I grew up listening to music really early. I, my sister was a, big music fan and she was five years older than me so mm. I was always getting educated from a very young age and the new because she was always into whatever that new cool band was <laughs> yeah. she was going to UC Berkeley back in the early 60s and she would always come back home with like you know, this, uh, gotta hear this girl Janis Joplin or you gotta hear but that was such a you know it was an interesting time because rock was you know, rock music was going, you know, through the, you know, through the late 50s, early 60s, uh, up to, up to, to 1970, was just going through so many transformations and going from modern to stereo. Oh, we can have the drums on the left. It was like, oh, this is the coolest new toy, you know, but it was all kind of young and innocent and fun. The Beatles were coming out with such cool, innovative stuff. Mm. Beach Boys with, you know, Pet Shops, oh my God, I mean, there were so, so many creative, cool things being done on that, and, you know, drugs were still fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, people weren't dying, uh, so, you know, but so it was kind of a, it was a fun experimental time to grow up, and, and I think maybe, I think that influences some of my decisions that I make now, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, I like to think that does, I mean... Uh, you know, just kind of growing up in that earlier era, it's, I think is beneficial to me now, making choices. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
I was talking to to Michael uh, Beinhorn a few weeks ago, and he had an interesting point about the Beatles and the whole Led Zeppelin, the rock era that you mentioned, and um, uh, the fact that we should that it's a shame that we don't have a almost like a new renaissance like that. That it's a shame that we're still looking back at those guys for inspiration. He dem- he thinks there should be a new a new artist that redefines music the same way. W- w- what's your thoughts on that? Because I find I, it I- interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, I have to agree with with you know it was it was you know it was such an interesting time just going from the you know especially in the late fifties early sixties. To, to the really kind of white red, really stiff presentation, some of the stuff on the radio that was the big hits, you know. Um, but there was this whole other cool thing going on with, you know, guys like Elvis and mm. and and all the, the whole Motown thing that was developing, and um, and then you know all the all the kids in England listening to old, you know, early or, you know, late 40s blues stuff that nobody, other other kids in America were listening to, Led Zeppelin and, 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 and you know, and, and those kids were all listening to, you know, I, I have this cover that, you know, I talk with this, about this with Mick Fleetwood a lot, because he, he was really in that era, era you know, mm-hmm. uh, guys like Peter Green who were listening to all these early blues artists from the U.S., and, but just having all those things come back, there were so many, and then the whole psychedelic sound coming out of San Francisco and Jimi Hendrix and mm. Janis Joplin, and uh, you know there were just so many things that were coming in. It was just you're being bombarded with, some, with something like, oh my God, that's what the what, you know, what the fuck is this? You know, <laughs> you know, every every week it seemed like you were bombarded with something. It was like so so out of left field from what you were hearing. You know, a month before it was a it was a super exciting time, and I have to agree with with Michael. It would be nice to hear. You know, I'd like to really hear some new things coming in like that. I mean, you know, when when rap really started coming out of New York, I think you know some of the early rap stuff out of New York and stuff. I remember I had a friend Eric Jacobson who had heard some. Some young rapper in a street corner in New York, and got his got his little tape recorder, and recorded some of them, and brought it back to Warner Brothers, trying to and trying to we brought that into an A and R meeting. It was like, man, this is this, this is like such a cool way to tell a story. It's going to be huge. And everybody was like, yeah, right, you know. But I mean, I, I mean that was, you know, that that and you know EDM. There was there has been some big things that came in. I mean. You know, I mean, you know, the whole advent of, of rap and and, ED, and also EDM stuff has really come in to influence everything mm-hmm. in pop music and you know what you know your mainstream cultural music these days. But you know, I, yeah, I'm always waiting to see when's that next like just crazy awesome thing going to come come around and, and really really turn the industry on its head. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. man. It would be awesome to experience that, especially as, like how you guys experienced it back in the 60s, 70s. Uh, I mean, when I, when I, you know, I, when I, when somebody brought me, uh, I was still in San Francisco, and a friend brought me some some tapes of NWA up there, and I was just oh. like, holy crap, what is this, mm. you know? I mean, that was been awesome. <laughs> Michael Jackson did such, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled. I heard some of that wreck. I remember going into, I was in the studio, I was working in the studio complex where right. they were working in the studio next door and they invited me to come over and, and hear some of the songs. And I just, I went in and it's like, by the time I finished listening to just the one tune, I was like, oh my God, like I want, I have to go back to my project and I feel like I just want to go back and cry. Like I'm, I'm like, so not as cool as what I just heard. You know, what could, you know? I mean, I got to go back and rethink my whole life. You know? <laughs> so I mean, the, 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 I mean, I think those moments have come along, and, right. you know. Right. And and 
I, I, yeah, I'm always I'm always super excited waiting for the you know whatever the next one is. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, you know maybe there's a chance I'll be part of what of it. You know. Yeah, exactly, man. Hopefully, um, we'll be on the lookout for new projects coming your way, uh, coming out from you, for sure. Um, but so success, because obviously, you know, you've had massive success through the years. Um, but what is success for you, and has it changed over the years? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, I, I always, uh, I mean, I just wanted to be able to do this for the rest of my life, you know. Um, and I still, you know, I still go through, the, you know, those down periods where I, you know, I'm worried that I'm not coming out with anything, you know, new and creative and, you know, and it's not even, I mean, the money's nice, but that's just a byproduct of me, like, buckling down and working really hard and, and finding something, you know, coming up with something that's cool and unique. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, the money part's just a byproduct of that. So being successful to me is I, I, I can keep making, I, I mean, I get to make music for a living. I mean, I've always think I'm from six. I, I mean, so far I've always been successful because I get to keep doing this, you know. Right. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I look back when I was, you know, first coming into high school and had thought about this is kind of what I wanted to do, and that I'm actually still here doing it. It's, mm. It surprises me every day, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Right. And that's awesome, man. I mean, like and like you said, money is usually never the goal anyway you know, for someone who really loves what they do and you know you're one of those people uh, who loves music so. it allows me to keep doing what i do you know sure. and so and you know and in some ways it's a gauge of my overall success because it allows me to keep doing this mm. um but you know but i made you know some of the records i'm most proud of that i've done most people wouldn't even know what they were, you know. I mean, I certainly have a lot of those in my in my discography that I look back on. Like God, this is like one of my favorite records, and you know, ninety percent of people or ninety five percent of people wouldn't even have a clue what it was. Could you name one for us? We can check it out. Um, there was a record called "Songs for a Blue Guitar" by Mark Eisel. Okay. Um, Love that record still. I put it on now. I listen and go, God, this just sounds so cool. Um, uh, there was another album. I had a I had a year where I did. It was I, it was like the year I called it the year of sad guys named Mark. Um, but I did a Mark Isel record that songs for blue guitar. I did another record with um, uh, a guy named. So that was the first one I did with Mark Koslick, then Mark Eisel, I did a record called 60 Watt Silver Lining. Right. Um, and I was also working with a friend of mine, Mark Eichem, who's now a big film composer down here in LA, but it was, the, the whole year was just like super sad guys named Mark. Right. Was, yeah. Right. Awesome, man. I mean, yeah, definitely check those records out. Uh, that would be nice listening. <laughs> I think people will like it too. Uh, but also looking back at your career, has there been any moments that stand out where you're like, damn, this is awesome. I can't believe I'm doing this project or maybe whatever it can be, some some highlight moment. I mean, when I, you know, I got, like, I would call a friend of mine at Warner, Rob Cavallo, and asked me to come down and, and to Los Angeles and, and help uh, Lindsey Buckingham finish up his record. Um, I mean, that was, and that was, well, it was a moment I've told the story before, but I was, you know, they gave me two or three days to work on this mix, mm. which is like way too much time for me right. because I start, then I, because, you know, I keep listening, oh, well, what if I do this? What if I change this? What if we add, like, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, my, I think it was the third morning, Lindsay was going to come in and I'm listening to what I've done. I've, like, changed the arrangement of the song. <laughs> And extra stuff, and just go, oh, fuck me. Yeah. Um, can I go, can I change it back here? Um, <laughs> trying to make another option with the automation, but, um, you know, I just, you know, I, 
It's like, all right, this is what I did, you know, win, win or lose, you know, Lindsay only here just come in and go, yeah, thanks, but uh, I'm going somewhere else. But he came in and, you know, he was, Lindsay's such a great guy, he's, you know, I really love working with him. He's so talented and he really, he listened and like, oh, they loved it. And they ended up changing the weather arrangement to play, play it live that way. They'd already been playing the song live. Ah, cool. Uh, but then that, you know, spiraled into, you know, we were working on Lindsay's album, but that kept grew, grew into a, a Fleetwood Mac album and then into a, a double Fleetwood Mac album. And, you know, I was, I was such a fan. I mean, I was a fan of the early Fleetwood Mac back in the 60s when, when, when it was Mick John, Peter Green. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But, you know, to be in that, like, God, I'm in the studio working with these guys, you know, it, I always, that always had to kind of pinch myself or something, but um, so, yeah, I mean, I've had a few of those moments over the over the years, but that's awesome, man. Uh, but do you have any moments where you thought, like, if you look at the other side of the coin, so to speak, where you thought, damn, this is hard, you know, how can I get out of this situation, for example? Um, I mean, I, I certainly have, have done some things that, that, you know, I've tried to finish up that work. I don't know if it was working as well, but, but you know, I try not to get in with, with people where, you know, we're just not, it's just not jiving, and it's, I, I, don't, I don't feel bad if it's not, you know, this just isn't working, and maybe for whatever reason, not, you know, no one's fault, but it's not, you know, I, we're not bringing we're, we're not making the song better working together or the album. And I certainly don't have a problem like going most hard ways, you know, before right. it gets to the point where you're, where you hate each other, you know, um, I, you know, I, I had, I had tougher ones earlier in my career when I couldn't really, it was harder for me to say no, which sometimes I would, but, um, but you know, I mean, I, I, would, I had, I had some, some fairly tough ones when I was young, um, but I, again, I you know I, ne I I didn't ever work for a studio. I never again I never worked for somebody else. I was always I had my own studio, my own company. Hmm. Yeah. So it wasn't like I you know if I was an engineer in a commercial studio and told the client, no, I can't. I'm not going to work with you. That would probably be the end of your job at the studio, but. That, you know, again, I always work for myself, so I didn't really have to worry but about that's it. that's also very cool. Like, I mean, you were very entrepreneurial in that way, I guess, from the start. Uh, so what actually, what actually drove you to not wanting to work in a studio? Or maybe you, that wasn't the choice, or? I, I mean, maybe I'm just hard to get along with. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think um, so. <laughs> <laughs> could, could be that. But, um, I, you know, I always just wanted to have my own place. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was in San Francisco. I had never been, I hadn't, hadn't done the normal way of working my way up through a studio. So I was a little more of an outcast because I hadn't put that, you know, been in as somebody's assistant and trained under them for five or six years. So right. I was a little more of an outsider, but I didn't, I didn't really care. You know, when I started competing and getting, you know, getting a lot of the good jobs and, you know, I started to become peers with people rather than just like, who, who the fuck is this guy? You know, he, you know, he isn't, he didn't work in Wally High Energy. He didn't come up through, well, you know, but, uh, you know, I mean, after I, you know, I had a few things that were really cool successes and I started getting like a lot more clients, you know, that I, I, I started getting to that point where I was, felt like I was peers with, with people. Right, right. Um, and what was your main way of building a client base when it did start out? Um, yeah, what was your process in that aspect? I mean, just, you know, go out to clubs. Right. You know, meet artists or go out with other bands and meet other artists. And, you know, I, I mean, one of the best things is having... You know, you have a you have a small band. And you work really hard on it, and 
it, the project comes out great and they go out and they talk to all their friends, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who, who, who makes this or who, you know, who recorded this? Well, it's Guy Mark, blah, blah, blah. It's, I find that word of mouth between bands really carries a lot of weight just because, you know, they, re they respect, you know, this is another band telling them. That, that this guy's good, rather than just me going up to it, somebody other, you know, coming off a stage and going, "Hi, my name's Mark," and, <laughs> you know, so, you know, meeting, you know, meeting other artists to other bands and just doing that kind of networking right. right from the beginning, you know, and sometimes I was working for very little money, but uh, you know, but I just worked all, you know, I've always worked, you know, 12, 16 hours a day, six, seven days a week. Mm. But how, how do you how do you keep your focus working those hours every day, uh, many many almost all days a week? How do you stay focused? Um, I take you know especially now I take a lot of I, you know because I I work by myself a lot you know especially over the past fifteen twenty years a lot more of that time is just me in the studio. Mm. I take a lot of breaks you know. Right. I get up and walk around. I'll you know since. When I switched over to working more in the box, I mean, I, when I first switched in 2005, I was kind of half in the box, half out. But right. um, and by, by 2008 or so, we were fully in the box. Um, that's good because I can be. It was so hard on SSL. Like I'm getting, feel like I'm getting buried in a project, and then I want to just switch to something else. Yeah, it's like. Right. Yeah, got to do the patch bag. Got to recall the console. It's two hours, you know. Mm. And by the time you get it, the next song sounding right, you feel like you should be back on the one you, you were on originally. Yeah. Um, but now I can, you know, I can, you know, if I really feel like I'm getting stuck on something, I can switch to another tune and work on that for a while. And right. usually, when I come back, I have clear, a little more clarity. All right, just take a break. I lay on the couch. I read my book for twenty minutes or something. Mm. Nice. And walk around. I you know, walk out. We live. My studio's in the park here, so I can, I can go out, and take the dog for a walk, and the awesome. river park for a minute. And <laughs> just something to clear your ears. I mean, if you start listening to something that's wrong over and over and over, mm. mentally, your ears and your brain just kind of adjust to make that sound right. Right. So, right. So, you know, if you just like get away and come back, maybe listen to something else, come back with a fresh perspective, clean your palate as it were. It's like, oh my God, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that's so wrong. <laughs> you know, you get that kind of aha of crap. Exactly. That was a really bad idea. Let's go back to, you know. Right, it makes sense, man. Um, and what, what are you reading to relax? And Oh, you know, I go to, I, I go to, you know, sometimes I'm doing historical fiction. I mean, I don't really have any one set of stuff that I read. I read a lot of books. I still read, you know, I read three or four books a week, maybe. Right. I mean, uh, so that was, is a mix of fiction or is it just fiction or is it a mix of stuff? I, I would say I'm all over the map. I usually go through periods right now. I'm in kind of a fiction period. I've been in that too long. i got to kind of swap, <laughs> right. swap it up, you know. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, uh, reading you is know. good for you, man. So yeah, I'm I'm glad. You know, I've always been a big I've always been a big reader since I was a kid. Um, nice. I started reading it pretty early. And, um, yeah. To it's me, it's good, just a, to me, it's such a different mental exercise than watching a movie or so. Mm -hmm. You know, just creating the you know really creating the story in your head. I think is it relaxes me. It's, it's more of a Zen moment or something mm -hmm. than actually watching a movie to me. I don't know. Yeah, it's the same for me. I mean, I recently I've always been back and forth, but now again, I'm I'm trying to read before going to bed rather than watch something on my phone. You know, uh, you know, it's it's it feels better. You sleep better, I think. Yeah, I read I, I read every night before I go to bed. Hmm. Uh, I read in the morning when I get up. Yeah. Um, so I do always book in reading when I when I go to bed when I first wake up in the morning. Um, and, you know, I'll take a break during the day. If I'm not taking a dog for a walk, I'll lay down and just read for 15 minutes or something just to right. kind of clear my head and come back with a fresh perspective on a mix. Awesome. 
Uh, do you have any uh, book recommendations when it comes to music, uh, whether that's audio or just anything music related? To be honest, um, I like. I mean, I used to. I started off by reading the audio encyclopedia, which I don't even know if they still make. Never heard of it. Was, <laughs> it was a huge book, and I would read that cover to cover like three or four times. Wow. But I started. I was kind of like, you know, just really trying to learn a lot of acoustic theory. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great book. It's not a, It's not like a fun read. Right, right, right. <laughs> or, that's okay. Hey, um, what? No, that, that, that's okay, man. <laughs> as long as it's educational, I guess. There's a book. Um, I have a friend uh, who wrote this book. Hold on, let me see what it is. It's called This Is Your Brain on Music. I was trying to see it over there. Um, oh, okay. Daniel Leventon wrote that. Um, he was a music producer that I met in San Francisco many, many years ago, but went on to, I think he went to Stanford and got a degree in, in, uh, neuro, in neurobiology. I can't, I'd have to look at his credits. Right, 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 right. Yes, uh, he's done a lot of studies on what actually happens in your brain hmm. when you're hearing a song or melody or words that, you know, here's what's happening that makes you love that song. Um, cool. Super interesting book. He has two or three books out. Awesome. Um, I'll check I it really, out. Yeah, I really love his stuff. I have a, my friend Mikkel um, from Airborne Talks event has a book out now called Hollywood Park that he wrote that's um, I mean, it's written by a musician. It's not really a music book, but I love the book. It was okay. awesome. Yeah. Awesome, man. Thanks for the recommendations. He's we'll, really great. we'll check them out. Yeah. Um, Mark, it's, it's been a pleasure. Maybe before we wrap up, uh, you can let the listeners know where they can uh, find more info about you or how they can potentially hire you for a mix or whatever. Um, just go to markneedham.com. I'll look, I'll let you can see everything we've done and what we're working on and um, and contacts, you know, there's a contact email there. And yeah, reach out, you know, but we always, I always love to hear, hear new stuff that people are working on. And, and, and I'm always, always interested in talking to new bands about projects. Awesome. And yeah, I'll leave a link to that below as well so people can click it and contact you, Mark. But yeah, thanks again for coming on. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Awesome, man. Thank you, Mark. It was a real pleasure talking to you and I hope you, the listener, enjoyed it as well. Again, please join the Audio Tribe. It's absolutely free. Get exclusive access to interviews before the public, live Q&As and live stream. It's free, of course. Just enter your name and email address using the link below and you are in. Also, feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel or Apple Podcast or wherever you are consuming this podcast. It was awesome having you here this week again, and I will see you guys very soon again.